Well, the first thing we did with the collection, and those of you who were familiar with the collection, it was in lots of brown paper bags and these kinds of cardboard boxes. So they were, it was soaking up humidity and mold and that kind of thing. And so we put the bulk of the collection back into uh, archival bags. So uh, it, it can withstand some of the climate changes and that kind of thing a little bit better. And it's also just easier to get at if researchers need to, to look at materials. We have 16 boxes of material. When you dig a site like this, you get uh, lots of stone tool debris. You get some clay pottery fragments. You get a lot of food Super remains, enough. bones. And then in this case as well, we, you get European-made artifacts that are reflecting reflection of interaction with, with fr the French, essentially. Um, the Zimmerman site's been a bit of a problem for people for years because it's many different time periods. It's, it's been a great place to live and to grow crops for a long, long time. And so we have this kind of mass of garbage out there and all kinds of pit features dug into the ground that produce things from 600 A.D., from 1200 A.D. or from 1600 A.D. And it's one of the things that we tried to do with the, this opportunity to re-look re at the material was to kind of try to parse all that out and to get a better sense of which artifacts dated to what time period and how we can start to talk more about the time that we're most interested in, which is the 1600s, when the Illinois had their grand village there at that site. And so there's two principal occupations at the, at the Zimmerman site. At one point, sometime in the 1500s, you have a movement of people for coming down from the Chicago area and settling the area, and we call that those people part of the, the, the Huber tradition. And we identify these, these cultural traditions primarily by the pottery they make. And so uh, a lot of what Margaret called Grid B, which is on the east side of the hotel, produced, this is a classic example of Huber pottery. And it looks to me like what happened is that you've got people living here and coming here seasonally and then something starts to change in the early 1600s. Sometime around 1600, 1610, um, the people that we know of as the Illinois arrived in this region probably from around Lake Erie. And we know that again by tracing pottery styles all the way back into Ohio. They got here probably around 1600, 1610 and at the same time the Huber remains start to, to, to vanish pretty rapidly. So it looks like there's a displacement. It looks like you have one group of people who've been living in the Chicago area for maybe a couple hundred years, had been coming down here a little bit, and then all of a sudden something starts to change, and the Huber materials disappear. Um, I'm of the opinion that, that what happened is that the Illinois came and displaced these people. And, and we see the Illinois, we, we recognize them archaeologically, by this stuff right here. This is a very distinctive pottery that's what we call Danner series pottery. Um, it's shell tempered. It has this distinctive little notching along the rim just below the lip here. When we find one of these, we know we're looking at somebody related to the Illinois. We dig up hundreds of thousands of prehistoric potsherds in Illinois all the time. We, we're buried by this stuff. We have thousands upon thousands of rim sherds from, let's say, the Mississippian period, say 1000 A.D., Cahokia Mounds, thousands of them. There's less than 200 rim sherds of Danner in Illinois, probably closer to about 125 that I can find. This is extraordinarily rare material because by the time that the Illinois were here, pottery wasn't as important in their daily life. For whatever reason they're making pottery, it's, it's, they're not producing that much of it, and the numbers, you know, the population has reduced, and their villages are very discreet. There's just a few places around that they spent enough time to start breaking their dishes, essentially. And so, um, so that's one of your principal artifact classes, is the ceramic. And that's how we tell time, and that's how we tell who, is through the ceramics. Um, this little bone item here doesn't look like anything at all, but in fact, it's a paintbrush. This is what you use to apply pigment to your skin or to hides. Um, we find these in different uh, historic settings and proto-historic settings, but this is actually the business end of the brush. This kind of, the sponginess of the bone held the paint well. So you kind of smear that in pigment and then you can make lines. How do you know that? 
So that's the thing about this collection, is yeah. that some of this stuff How do, how do you know that, Bob? I mean, I well, don't like that a stone. Like a rock. <laughs> no, I don't. on the water. This one's broken. I've seen intact ones, and I've seen better ones that are, that are, that are quite clearly, you can see that it's a tool. Oh. So once you've seen enough of them, then you can see them when they're broken or when they weren't particularly attractive to begin with. But this is a very significant artifact, and that's the problem with this stuff, is that it doesn't look like much. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the problem with keep keeping this and making sure that people know that this is a lot more interesting than it looks. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we can put these things on display, though, too. Um, so, you know, a lot of this has got roots in, you know, that go thousands of years back. Native Americans taking things from the forest and making stuff out of them, right? Well, the difference, of course, after 1610 or so in Illinois is you start to get this trickling in of European goods through the fur trade. And the European trade goods, things that the, the Europeans brought here to trade for furs with the Aboriginal populations, arrived here many, many years before the Europeans did through down-the-line trade. In Illinois, History starts in 1673. That's the first time that we know of that a European came here and wrote something down. And that, of course, was Father Marquette, who established his mission there at the Zimmerman site. And so we see at the Zimmerman site um, some of the very, very oldest and earliest European artifacts that are found in the Western Great Lakes. Um, these are trade beads that probably date to the 1650s, 1640s, 1650s. Most of what I've looked at looks to me like it predates Marquette's arrival by almost a generation. So I think a big part of, the, of your collection was in the ground before Marquette even got here. So we don't want to think of this site as beginning in 1673. That's just when it became part of our European consciousness. So there's neat stuff in here. And what we've done then is... Uh, is just get it documented and we've tried to pull the better samples out and get a better idea of what Huber was doing here, what Danner was doing here as far as, the, I, I speak in pottery types instead of names of people, but we're getting a better sense of changes over time at the site than we had 30 years ago. So things keep changing as we dig around out there and this collection though from the 1970s that Margaret excavated is the core of the Zimmerman site. Nobody has dug up more material, and if, it's, if there's going to be a site in Illinois that speaks for the Illinois tribe during the 1600s, it's this, this site. We're not going to have another site that's going to speak that way in this state. Now, we have one in Missouri that speaks of the Peoria very well. This probably speaks more of the Kaskaskia. These are different bands within that broad heading that was, called, that was known as Illinois. Is and it worth going back and dig around some more at this site? It's always worth it, but we've, we're very careful about that now because um, there's so much that's being destroyed that we try to focus on what's about to be destroyed. And this site now has been purchased by the state. It's stable. It's safe, except for the shoreline, which is still eroding. And, for instance, it was much more important to spend a year looking at this stuff again before we go back and ever dig again. One of the things that I'm doing is going around to collections, though, and looking at things that have come out of the ground years ago. I just got back from northern Wisconsin doing the same thing with material that dates to the same time period. And sure enough, there's some of this up there. Mm -hmm. These people got around. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that's how Father Marquette knew to come here. He learned about the Illinois while he was had a mission on Lake Superior. And we just got done looking at the site that he was living at before he came here. So it all links up. It's all one big story. I mean, that's, I, I want to point out, too, that this is extremely, uh, this was a big deal. It always, it still is a big deal. This wasn't salvage. This wasn't a highway going through. This was research-based excavations, which are, require funding. And it's a lot harder to do. And because of what Edmund was doing here, this happened. And it's usually one or two people that make or break a project like this. And one of them is sitting here right here right now. I mean, if it wasn't for Edmund, this stuff wouldn't be out of the ground. And we don't get that opportunity very often. So, we still remember. <laughs> you invited the prom.